everyone. Let's give the Lord a good hand praise. Hallelujah. This is a wonderful atmosphere. Thank you, Jesus. I understand that prayer and fasting has been taking place. You probably wouldn't have to tell me that, having been a part of the service. You know, the devil has no defense for purity. And when you begin to fast and pray, the devil doesn't have the advantage that he used to have. And there's a level of liberty that we enjoy in God because of prayer and fasting. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I believe that there are some people here today who are making a special connection to God because of prayer and fasting. And I know this is a day of change, as Pastor Brown has talked about. I want you to turn your Bibles to Second Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. It is great to be back with uh, Pastor and Sister Brown. They are dear friends. We love them very much. And uh, I've always enjoyed being at this church. Amen. And you're right, Brother Brown. It is it's a great sacrifice to be here today. <laughs> and uh, you're, they're going to be showing the whole world when the Packers play the Giants this afternoon exactly what it's like in Wisconsin. And uh, I know you don't have any clue what that's all about, but Trust me, it can be uh, it can be uh, tough to endure. I happen to be Hispanic, you know. That's even worse. I, I think I was created to live in this kind of weather, and somehow the Lord put me in Wisconsin. So I just walk around my house in a snowmobile suit, and everything's great. Second Kings chapter two, verses nine through fourteen. The Bible says, "And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I take.'" I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me, when I'm taken away from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle, everybody say the mantle, of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted, and Elisha went over. I want to preach to you on this subject this morning. Throw down your coat. Throw down your coat. Jesus, we thank you for this time. And I'm asking you now, Father, for your anointing to come, to minister to us. Lord, we are open. We are open to your Spirit. We're open to whatever you want to do today. In Jesus' name. Turn to three people and tell them, throw down your coat. You may be seated. Elijah was the bishop. Everybody say the bishop. He was the most highly regarded man of God of his time. Wherever he walked, miracles happened. Wherever he walked, kings trembled. When he prayed, fire fell from heaven. He left nothing but uh, awe in his wake. Wherever he would walk, people would just look at him and be astounded at the measure of anointing and power that he had with God. The other anointed men of its time would never presume to have the anointing that Elijah had. So they referred to themselves as the sons of the prophet. They wouldn't call themselves the prophet. They wouldn't even use that in their vocabulary. They could only aspire to be a son of the prophet. And so word, as you can imagine, spread like wildfire. 
as the word was carried from house to house that God was soon to carry the bishop out of this world. It was going to be in a way that it only happened one other time in this manner. There was a man by the name of Enoch. The Bible refers to him that he walked with God and that he was not because God took him. There was a little mini rapture and he was caught away. And Elijah was going to be caught away in a similar manner. And everybody knew. I don't know how they knew, but they knew it was a known thing. And and so uh, there were people that were were looking from a distance, wanting to see this happen. And and Elisha, not the bishop, not Elijah, but Elisha, makes up in his mind for whatever reason that he's going to walk with the bishop. He's going to stay close to him. He doesn't want to miss this God moment. There is something in his heart that is hungry. There's a longing. There's a desire to be a part of this rapture experience. And I can't tell you exactly where it all started from, but I'd have to tell you that I would imagine that Elisha had received some visions from God about what the Lord wanted to do with his life. Is there anybody here that the Lord has kind of talked to you about what he wants to do with your life? What he wants to do with his church. And I really believe that Elisha knew he could never accomplish what needed to be accomplished without a special anointing upon his life. And so he trails this anointed man of God. He doesn't want to let him out of his sight. And and, uh, I can tell you that's good advice. Don't let the anointed man of God out of your sight. Some people allow that to happen and they become disillusioned with leadership and some people think that it's their anointing that's going to carry them. God always works through anointed leadership and the church said amen. Finally, the bishop, I don't know if he was irritated or what, he has... uh, invited Elijah, Elisha to, to stop. And I'm going to go on. You just stay here and I'm going to go on. This is my day. This is my moment to go on and be carried away to be with the Lord. And, and Elijah kind of just ignores him and he keeps following him until finally the bishop turns to this young man and he says, what is it that you want from me? There's something on your mind here, young man. Uh, you're not, you're not being, uh, turned away. You're, you, you're not, uh, you're not going to allow your quest to follow me, to be frustrated. So, what do you want? Huh. And Elisha says something to the bishop that is staggering. As a matter of fact, some of us would think that this would be presumptuous to say this. But he turns to the bishop. And he says, I want a double portion of what you have. Don't you think it would have been enough just to say, I want to be like you. You know, like the Michael Jordan commercials, I want to be like Mike. I just want to sort of be like you. I just want to linger in your shadow. I just want the same touch that you want. That wasn't what Elisha said. He said, I want a double portion of anointing on my life greater than you have. And I want you to know that today there is a double portion anointing that is falling on this generation of the church. I believe it, brother, you referenced it today when you said that the latter rain will be greater than the former rain. There's a greater work that God is going to do in this last day. And there's a greater anointing that is going to fall on this last day. I want to talk to some young people and tell you, you don't have time to develop a 40-year ministry. So God is going to put a special 40-year anointing on your life if you'll get hungry for it. There's some people that are new in the church, but don't let anybody look down on you because you're new. Because there's a special anointing that's going to mature you. There are things that you're going to see that people haven't seen in 20 years of ministry. There is an anointing that is going to fall on this church. Why don't you give the Lord a hand praise? Hallelujah, Lord, I want a double portion. Oh, hallelujah. I got to shake that tree just a little bit. We're you. We live in a culture of grabby people. We live in a culture where people are used to saying, excuse me. People are pushing to the front of the line. People are assertive. People are trying to get ahead. People are looking to the finish line. 
If there was ever something that you need to be aggressive about, it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost on your life. If there was ever something that you would grab for, oh my God, just like uh, that young man who reached after God, Jacob. Uh, He was passive by nature. He was a man who hung around the tents. He was a man who would practice uh, Betty Crocker recipes on the family. He wasn't a man's man. He didn't have hair on his chest. But when he saw an anointing, he got a hold of it. And he said, I don't care what my personality is like. I see an opportunity and I'm not going to let it go. I don't care what your personality is like. I don't care how you pursue the secular world. It's time to get your game face on. There's an anointing for people that will reach for it and fight for it. Somebody said amen. Bishop, I want a double portion of anointing. And at first, Elijah appears to be surprised by this young man's response. And he says, you've asked a hard thing. You've asked a hard thing. But nevertheless, if thou seest me when I'm taken from you, it will be so unto you. But if not, It will not be so. He was saying, if you're there, if you see it, then you're going to enjoy a double portion anointing on your life. And I think it's interesting. He said, nevertheless, if you see me. Do you know it's possible to be on location and not see what God's doing? It's possible to be in a church like this. I feel the presence of God in this place. I feel the spirit of revival in this place. It's possible to be possible to be on location of a revival church and not know revival and not see revival and not see the opportunity for anointing to rest upon your life. People, we got to wake up. we got to see what is happening in this place. It's not enough to be around worshipers. It's not enough to, to be around apostolic people. You've got to see it for yourself. You've got to experience it for yourself. You've got to be here. Right in the middle of a God moment. But it's not enough to be on location. You've got to see what God is doing right now. This moment. And so after this journey, finally, it happens. Turn to your neighbor and say, it happens. Air Horse One comes shooting out of the sky. Grabs the bishop. What an amazing thing. I hope that there's a way for us to see some of these moments in Bible history when we get to heaven. I want to see that. I'm going to hang around heaven's DVD section for a thousand years. I just want to see the whole history of man replayed from start to finish. I want to see this, how this happened. In a blast of heat and fire, the bishop is swept up into the sky. And somehow Elijah, the bishop, has the presence of mind. While he's traveling into the outer outer, uh, reaches of, of the sky, he has the presence of mind to take his coat and to pull it off and to fling it over the side of the chariot to the ground. He didn't forget his word. And Elisha sees that mantle falling to the ground. And the Bible says that when it hit the ground, he ran and he grabbed that that cloak. And, and there's something something's amazing about this. Before he did that, don't let me get ahead of myself here. The Bible says that he took his garment. Before he grabbed the cloak, he took his garment and he tore it in half. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, he did not do that just for a Kodak moment. He didn't do that just to kind of, to just show everybody how passionate he was. You've got to understand what was happening at that moment. You have to understand that in Bible times, the cloak varied in size and material. But one thing is for certain, the cloak identified who you were. Your cloak identified your sex, your class, your occupation. The cloak identified who you were as a person. When Elijah tore his garment, it was a very symbolic act. 
He was saying, there's no going back to who I was. I'm getting ready to take on a new anointing. I'm getting ready to take on a new identity. And I'm not going back to yesterday. I'm embracing what God is asking me to be. I'm here to tell you today, there's a special anointing falling on this church. The Lord spoke to me early this morning and gave me this message. There is something powerful that is resting on this church because of your prayer and on your fasting. But before you can take on a new anointing, you've got to throw down your cloak. You've got to throw down yesterday. You've got to throw down what's hindering you from having a new identity in God. Why don't you clap your hands to the Lord? Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm interested in a greater passion. I'm greater and interested in greater things. Miracles. There's going to come a day in this church where it's not unusual to talk about miracles. It's not going to be unusual to talk about baptisms and people being filled with the Holy Ghost. Marriages are going to be fixed. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel a spirit of prophecy coming over me right now. This church is going global. This church is going beyond Pasadena, California. And it's time for the church to tear off your cloak and say, I'm ready for a new anointing on my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm reminded of a story in Mark chapter 10. The Bible says that they came to Jericho. And as Jesus went out of Jericho with his his disciples, in Mark chapter 10, verse 46, a great number of people, a blind bar of Timaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd began to charge him to hold his peace. They said, be quiet. You don't understand. This is, this is the moment where we're playing pomp and circumstance. This is, this is a special and sacred occasion. There's no need for your passion. You just be quiet. If the Lord wants to come to you, He'll come to you. But He had other intentions. You know, every once in a while, you just need to lift up your voice if you want God's attention. Every once in a while, you just need to be aggressive about the fact that you need a touch upon your life. He cried the more a great deal, Thou Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of comfort, rise. He calleth thee. Watch. Verse 50. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. The moment that old blind bar realized he had an appointment with the master, he threw down his coat because he was saying, I'm a beggar no more. I am blind no more. I've got a new identity. You know what? Some of us will never have a miracle till we take off our coat. You want God to take it off you? He says, you take off your coat. You repent of complacency. You repent of rebellion. You repent of bitterness. You repent of those things that have held you back every weight in sin. You lay it down and I'll give you a new coat. Come on, people. We need to throw down the coat to let the Lord know we're ready for a miracle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are people here that are tired of being spiritual beggars, living living off of the crumbs of the master's tables, talking about bygone blessings and what we used to do. There are people here today that are tired of being disfigured by sin. There are people here today that are tired of addiction. And you're tired of the enemy scoring at will in your home and upon your children. And you're ready for something new to break forth in your life. There are some people that used to cast a critical eye on others as there would be a special God moment 
And people would sit there unmoved and unfazed. And now we realize that somehow we have been relegated to that position where we can't feel like we used to feel. And there seems to be a, a, a hard heart where there used to be an impressionable one. And we don't know how to get through it. We don't know how to get beyond it. And I want you to know God is here today to bring something new to your life. There's a new coat waiting for you. This new coat is going to change everything. It's a coat of anointing. But that coat of anointing is never going to rest upon your life until you take the old one off. Brother Brown, I was talking to you several years ago when you were evangelizing. I never forgot what you said. You talked about the trademarks of revival churches. I was asking you about it because you had traveled a lot. And one of the things that you said that was a common thread, a common denominator of all churches that are having breakout revival was the fact that they have powerful worship. Powerful worship. You mentioned two other components, but that was one of the components. And I want to tell you today, if your cult is hindering you from worshiping God, you need to take that coat off. I'm going to tell you. It's so powerful. You know how those rockers rock shoot up into the sky? And, and, and uh, they're, just, they're just going. Finally, they hit that outer stratosphere. They've got to go on. You know what they do? They have to drop some things off in order for them to go further. And I feel in the Holy Ghost to tell this church and to tell people here today, whose resolve to be a worship is a worshiper is in question. I'm here to tell you today, you have got to take that garment off because that's a key in allowing this church to go beyond. Oh, I know you're higher than you used to be. I see a lot more faces than I saw the last time I was here. I sense a deeper anointing and a, a deeper worship than when I was here the last time. And God is doing powerful things. But God isn't finished. The journey of this church is not finished. But I want you to know if your garment is hindering you from worshiping, you need to take it off because this church is going forward. This church is going on. You know the story of David? How the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred article that Israel had, it symbolized God's presence. It symbolized His sanction that was with God's people. How it had been returned to uh, Israel and now it was on its way to their capital city. And King David was so excited about that. And you, you know the story about how he took off his kingly garment. Do you remember that? Now, I, I think the spirit of worship was on David when his kingly garment was on. I think it was there. And he thought, you know, God is so good. His presence is coming back to Israel. This is awesome. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And he's looking down at his Armani suit. And he thinks, I don't, I don't want to sweat through this thing. I don't want to mess this up. This is an expensive coat. This is an expensive garment. This represents my leadership. This represents uh, God's touch upon my life. He has placed me here. I, I, you know what I think? I think because he didn't want to mess up the garment, because he respected the garment, he thought, you know, I can't have my worship in my garment too. He just made up his mind. Now, if I've got to choose between having this garment and, and, and for people to know that I'm king and for people to know that I'm anointed, or if I, if I could just have God and be in His presence, I think I'll just take God and I'll take His presence. He was wise to take off the kingly garment so that He could have freedom in His worship. I got news for you. You can't have your pride and your worship at the same time. We got to stop worrying about what people think about us. We got to stop worrying about how sophisticated we look and realize the presence of the Lord is returning to Pasadena in a measure that has never been known before. And it's time to be worshipers. Your worship's going to impact revival. Somebody said amen. If there is some injury of your past or some bitterness that is holding you back, Somebody offended you. 
Somebody said something to you and you never got over it. And I thought church people were all perfect and I thought everybody was kind and, and I can't believe this happened or that happened or that leader got mad at me or that person lost their temper and they should have known better. I've got news for you. You better take that coat off because you can't have that grievance in your spirit and God's anointing at the same time. Come on, let's just talk about that for a minute. I know that there are people here today, you have been, you have been hurt. I know what it's like to be hurt. As a child, I was hurt. Somebody, uh, uh, an adult, uh, co- committed a terrible act against my innocence in my childhood. And I struggled with bitterness. I struggled with anger. And the older I got, the more angry I became. It started to take over my identity. Until I knew I had a calling on my life. And finally one God knocked on my door and He said, You can't have that, anoint, that the anointing and that unforgiveness at the same time. What are you going to do about it? While you're preaching about a God who forgives, what are you going to do with your unforgiveness? When you preach about a God of mercy, what are you going to do with the fact that you haven't shown mercy to this situation? And the Lord helped me. He took me on a road of forgiveness. It didn't happen in one prayer, in case you're wondering. It was a journey of forgiveness. And I laid it down. And I wept and I cried. And the enemy came back to my door a few days later. You know how you remember things? And you can get mad all over again about things that have happened years and years ago? And the enemy came back and you know what? I shut the door in his face because I put it under the blood. And later he came back and I had to slam the door in his face and keep it under the blood. But I stand to you today not a victim. I stand whole. By the power of the Holy Ghost. And guess what? I've got some anointing on my life. Because I made up my mind. If I've got to wear a coat of anointing, I'll let whatever else go that I've got to let go of. Come on, somebody needs to forgive right now. You need to forgive your spouse. You need to forgive your children. You need to forgive a leader. You need to forgive a neighbor. You need to forgive somebody that hurt you in your past. And lay it down. Somebody said amen. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with all my heart. Oh, Jesus, help us today. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost prompting me right now. Jesus. Jesus. So what could they do to you? You and I both know that saying sorry wouldn't be enough. Oh, you say all you need is an apology, but that's not true. You still remember. Put a numerical value on it. Put a a monetary value on your injury. You'll be hard-pressed to find a number that would be enough. So you have a choice right now. You can sit here and be angry over the fact That there is a debt that is owed to you. And you can spend the rest of your life letting your identity be wrapped up in your grievance. You can't trust people. You can't be real. You've got to live with an outer shell that nobody can get through. You can't be comforted because you keep comfort away. You can struggle with that in your life. Because there's an unforgiven debt where you can forgive the debt. I'm telling you, it's powerful when you make up your mind. I'm not going to frustrate, frustrate myself over a payment that's never coming. So I'm forgiving the debt. It's wrong. If there's somebody in this room that you won't talk to, it's wrong. If there's somebody that you don't even like to think of, oh my Lord, that you like, that, that you don't even want to talk to in the house of God, and you might say, well, 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 that's not me. It could happen. You know, when you're in a growing church, that poses problems, Pastor Brown. All of a sudden, you, 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 you're building. And all of a sudden, you realize it's not enough. 
The square footage we thought was going to help us, was going to give us a couple of years, we filled it up in a year, and now we have another problem. And, and now we've got more new converts, and we've got more spiritual babies, and their diapers need to be changed. Oh my! And they need to be burped, and the nursery's not big enough, because we've got so many spiritual babies, and well, all of a sudden our time is taxed, and our efforts are taxed, and, and we can start getting a bent in our spirit, even about growth, and godly things, and good things. It should not be that way. Amen. We need to be unified. Hallelujah. You know, remember how uh, Joseph wrestled with an angel? Are you getting better at that bass guitar play? You can thump, bro. Wow. But you remember that? Do you remember how they were wrestling? Wow. All night long they're wrestling. And, and, and I have a tendency to think that that, that angel was surprised that this mortal man who was wrestling, maybe, maybe there was even a... And they're wrestling. And finally the angel says, that's enough. And he touches the hollow of his thigh. Oh, he touches the hollow of his thigh. And, and guess what? It's an amazing thing. Joseph never, uh, Jacob never walked the same again. The angel goes on his way. He's ready for round two now. I made him look bad. Watch this now. Watch this. From that moment forward, Jacob was no longer the deceiver, but he, he was blessed. But guess what? He still walked with a limp. You look at your brothers and your sisters. You can focus on their limp, their weakness, Nobody walks perfectly straight. You can look at your brother and say, there's a blessing. There's my brother in the Lord. There's my sister in the Lord. Come on, I'm talking about taking off some things today that have been hindering us. Because there is a preferred future for this apostolic church. Somebody said amen. Brother Soto, you're saying things that are true. Of course, we want a double portion anointing on our lives. So what's the problem? Why, why do I have to bring this to our attention? Why do I have to challenge us to receive something so powerful and so exquisite? God's divine creation, a double portion anointing. Why do I have to preach to you? Why is it so hard to embrace a double portion anointing? Here it comes. Because there's a problem with old coats. You see, old coats are very comfortable. They're very familiar. How many times have we been in services just like this? God put something special in our lives. Walked out. We put the old coat back on. Because it was familiar. I don't know what it is about us guys, but our wives have to tell us when our clothes are old. I just keep wearing the same shirt, wearing the same shoes, until my wife says, time out. Time out. T-shirts. I'm horrible about T-shirts. And my wife will finally say, I'm throwing your T-shirts away. What's wrong with them? You know? Looks tie-dyed. They've never been tie-dyed before. You know, it's just... No longer white, but gray. And You don't even realize how bad they look until you get a new T-shirt on. Come on. And then you're like, oh, I can't believe that I was wearing that. We don't realize how bad we look sometimes. We don't realize how complacent we are sometimes. And God prompts us and He says, I've got something new for you. I've got something powerful for you. But for you, but, but it's so comfortable to be in that old coat. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's time to take off that coat of offense. It's time to take off that coat of a suffering and a fear and of addiction. That coat isn't pretty anymore. Do you hear what I'm saying? As we're trying to reach the world, if our coat is frustrating God's purpose in the church, it's not pretty anymore. 
Somebody said, Amen. First Samuel 2.19 Moreover, his mother made him a little coat, referring to Samuel, and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. How many of you know the story of Hannah and Samuel? How she couldn't have a baby and she wept and the Lord heard her cry and she said, God, if you give me a baby, I'll, I will give him back to you. And she did. She literally, she weaned her. She brought him to the Lord's house, to church, and she left him there to serve the priest, the ministering priest. She completely dedicated her son to the purpose of God, but she did something. Every year she would return with a bigger coat. You see, it's natural. Growth should be a natural thing in our lives. I'm not just talking to people that are back, totally backslidden and uh, slack abiding. And I'm not just talking to people that are living in, in moral sin. I'm talking to some people you know you've been on the plateau for a while. And you know it's been a while since you've been in a new place with God. It's been a long time since you've just had a real, true, authentic, fresh touch of anointing upon your life. Listen, people, even in the natural, it's normal for us to yearly get a new coat, a bigger coat. And in the spirit, we need to come to expect that. Or we can look back at three and five and ten years and realize we've made no progress in God. God has brought us to a place where we all need to change our coats. Now, I'm sure that Sister Brown is one of those amazing shoppers like my wife. She's got her Ph.D. in shopping, black belt, whatever they call it. And I'm convinced you, as my wife, probably when you pick clothes for your children, you buy things just a little big. I always know when my children get new clothes. Because the cuffs are rolled up, you know, and the sleeves are flapping over their hand. Oh, you got something new. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, God is going to do something in your life. It's going to seem too big for you. Just put the coat on. Just put the coat on. Because when you put the coat on, now you can grow. And now God can show Himself strong. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. And He's not always going to ask you to do things that you know you can do. Every once in a while, you've got to step out of the boat and onto the Word. Oh, hallelujah. And trust that God is going to be faithful and deliver things into your lives. Brother Brown, I believe you can pastor thousands of people. I believe that the saints of God are in this place can disciple and teach Bible studies and minister in levels and places and arenas that they never thought possible. Hallelujah. You're going to grow. Don't be intimidated by a new coat. Hallelujah. I need to get the landing gear out. In the story of Joseph, he had to lose two coats before he could be useful to God. The first coat in Joseph's life was the coat of comfort. You know how Joseph was given a coat of many colors. And it spoke to the fact that his father preferred him above all his other brothers. It spoke to the fact that he was the golden child. He was the anointed one of the family. And he enjoyed the earthly affirmation that was on his life. It was a coat of comfort. It was a coat of a a false sense of security. It was a coat that reflected man's opinion. It's what the world gave to him. And I want you to know, saints of God, we can't be what God wants us to be if we hold on to that coat of comfort. One day, if you are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you truly walk close to Jesus... Sometimes the spit will land on you. Sometimes the blows will land on you when you get close to Jesus and His cross. Sometimes the dying gets close to you and you're misunderstood and and it's not so easy and your extended family doesn't understand decisions that you've made and and why don't you party like you used to and you were so much more fun and and now people are a little uncomfortable because you're a person of convictions and you're not just a fish floating downstream but you're swimming against the current and you one day you will lose your coat of comfort. 
But you've got to come out of that coat. The Bible says in Genesis 37 verse 23 that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. In other words, he didn't want to go out of the coat. They had to strip him out of it. He was fighting with them. He didn't want to lose that security. He didn't want to lose that affirmation. He didn't want to lose that sense of significance. Sometimes we won't come easily out of our coats, but we have to. And if you'll do that, you'll come out of that coat. Next one will be easy. Fast forward Joseph's life. Now, he's in Potiphar's house. He's been sold into slavery. He doesn't have a coat anymore. He wears a servant's coat. And Potiphar's wife, who I believe was gorgeous, I believe she was a beautiful woman. He was a leader in Egypt. He had a trophy wife. She was stunning. She sees something special about Joseph. And she begins to try to lure him into an affair through seduction and words. And, and, and the Bible says that, that Joseph had to fight with her. It, was, it wasn't just one moment. But it was a long-term commitment to purity in his life. Day after day, he was fighting her. And he wouldn't listen to her. Finally, her husband leaves. And she becomes aggressive. And she grabs him. Literally grabs him. And the Bible says, what did he do? She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Can I tell you what? If you get into the habit of getting out of old coats, God will always have a new one for you. And the next coat that he put on that the Bible records is when he's standing in the king's palace and they put on kingly raiments upon him because he came out all out of all the other coats. Come on, people. It's time for us to realize there's a new coat coming and it's a special, powerful coat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm asking you today, brothers and sisters, don't stoop to be like anybody else. God has a very special anointing for you. I believe that anointing is unique to the individual. I really do. You'll you'll study in the Bible that, that anointing had a very unique blend to it. And and there are men like Pastor Brown, he has a special anointing on his life, and it's not like my anointing. It's a different anointing. It's a powerful anointing, but it's a different anointing. And you have an anointing on your life. Do you know what? Let your coat be a unique coat. You guys are getting ready to march off the map. I believe that in the Holy Ghost. There are some things when I talk to your pastor and listen to his vision, his passion, he's going to march this church right off the map to places. There aren't, no book, there aren't any books on it. Nobody's been there before. This isn't going to be one of those relevant churches that's trying to keep up with everybody else. Relevant means you're just keeping up with everyone else. This is going to be a church that people are going to look to for leadership. There's a special anointing on this church. God's going to do special things with this church. And in order for that to happen, you have to embrace your unique and special anointing from God. One of the greatest things that David could ever do for his own life was to tell Saul, Saul... Your armor doesn't fit me. He just took the anointing that God had for his life, and he took the giant down with a slingshot. Hallelujah. I don't want to be a counterfeit. I don't want to aspire to anybody else, and that's what I love about Elisha. He said, Elijah, Bishop, you're a great man, but I don't want to be you. I don't want to have what you had. I want a double portion. And if you study out the miracles, seven major miracles in Elijah's life, and 14 major miracles in Elijah's life, because he wasn't going to wear a counterfeit coat. Isn't that powerful? In conclusion, as the musicians come. So Elisha sees the mantle, and he picks it up. Tearing off his old coat, throwing down his coat, he gets a new one. And guess what he did? This is astounding to me. This is absolutely brazen that he would do this. He walks to the River Jordan. They had just walked through the River Jordan a few moments before. And he takes the anointing cloak 
and he smacks the river Jordan. So what? And he says, show me the God of Elijah. Lord, I've got the mantle. Now I want to know it works. And the waters parted. God showed to Elisha, I've got some for you. We do not use our anointing to just come and talk about how saved we are. We don't use our anointing just to come together and hold hands and say, isn't it great to be a part of the body of Christ? It's time to take this mantle outside of these four walls into your workplace, into your neighborhood. Come on, somebody's going to start a small group in your neighborhood. Somebody's going to teach a Bible study to their manager, to their boss. Oh, yes, this church is going to touch leaders in this community. But somebody's going to have to take that anointing and say, I've got to see it for myself. I'm not just going to talk about it in theory. It's time to pray prayers of faith. It's, oh, it's time to walk into hospitals and lay hands on the sick and see that they recover. It's time to see the power of God demonstrated as it's never been demonstrated before. Would you stand with me? Pastor Brown said this is a day of change. He's right. There's a double portion anointing that's going to fall on this congregation in just a moment. But before I pray, a double portion blessing over you. we got to take the coat off. If it's pride, if it's unforgiveness, if it's unrighteous anger, if it's addiction, don't be, don't be afraid. It's God's moment to show Himself strong in your life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I want to open this altar for somebody that's ready for a new coat. I want you to come to this altar. I want you to throw down the old coat. I want you to pray words that mean something to God. Because there's a new coat that's getting ready to fall upon your life. Upon your ministry. Upon your leadership. I rebuke fear. I rebuke doubt. you have never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost this is your day come to the front receive God's gift for your life lift your hands now lift your hands as a sign of surrender come on throw down your coat in Jesus name Father purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Maybe you're here today and you've always longed for God. You've always longed to have a deep, powerful relationship with God. But your weaknesses have always gotten in the way. Come on, this is your day to press forward and to begin something special with God. There's no going back to yesterday. I'm not going back to that old identity. I'm not going back to that spiritual poverty. I'm not going back to that brokenness. Somebody needs to call out to God like blind Bartimaeus. Lord, look. No coat. Look, God, I'm taking my coat off. I need a new touch. Ready to fall. 
fall. This anointing's getting ready to fall. Come on, throw down your coat. It's not enough just to be on location. You've got to see this in the Spirit. You've got to be there in the Spirit when it happens. portion anointing I want you to lift your hands right now I'm getting ready to pray a blessing over you right now if you're ready I believe God's ready to touch this church there's no going back by the authority that is in the word of God and the power that is in the name of Jesus I pray a blessing over Life Church right now and everyone that stands here before you with their hands raised. Father, if you've ever anointed me, I'm asking you to anoint them. If you've ever spoken through me, I'm asking you, Father, to speak through them. If you've ever blessed me, Father, would you bless them? If you've ever given me any measure of wisdom, Father, give it to them. If you've ever used me in the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, I pray that you would use them. If you've ever given me a measure of faith, give it to them. And Father, now, I pray that you would give them a double portion of everything you ever placed in my ministry. I pray that you would lay it upon them now to serve you, to do a work, Father like has never been seen before in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Embrace that anointing right now. Embrace the anointing now. Yes, Father.
Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing again. God's doing a work even right now. The Holy Spirit is falling in this place. People's lives are being changed. God spoke to us today. How many believe that? That the word of the Lord was directed and, and powerful, pointed. Amen. And, and uh, we're excited because uh, Claudia and her daughter are going to be baptized in Jesus' name right now. Hallelujah. God's done a great work in their lives and this family and God's going to continue to do it and uh, we're excited about that. If you guys want to come come up to the front, we're going to uh, rejoice together with uh, Sister Claudia and, and her family and uh, just kind of come up to the front here and we're going to be dismissed in just a moment as has been mentioned. Those that are um, uh, those that are a part of the, uh, the Capital Stewardship Campaign staff uh, Sister Kathy's talked to you and, um, and there is uh, luncheon downstairs and then Brother Soto is going to speak to us directly. He's going to meet with each team this week. So uh, praise the Lord. It's good what the Lord is doing. Let, let's just uh, worship the Lord one more time in this song as they prepare. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. It's a new season. It's a new day. Fresh anointing is coming my way. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season and it's coming to me. It's a new season. It's a new day. Do you believe the fresh anointing is coming my way? Soto preached about today, casting off the old and taking the new. The Bible said that when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you surrender your will to Him, that you're saying, in essence, I'm not going to be in charge or in control anymore. The old person that used to rule this life, I'm going to choose that that person's going to die. And the Bible says we're crucified with Jesus Christ. Not that we go hang on a cross, but that the old person that used to be in charge, we choose to put that person to death. And then after repentance, the next step, the Bible says we are buried with him in baptism. Remember, after Jesus died and was crucified, he was buried. And after Jesus was buried, then he rose again. Here's the point. There can't be newness of life and resurrection without burial. Jesus could not rise again until he was buried. Amen. And the miracle of water baptism is that uh, Claudia is going down the waters of baptism. She's given her life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's already filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The old person that she used to be, that uh, wasn't necessarily a believer and had some sins in her life, that old person is going to be buried. And when she comes out, that old person is going to stay in the water. And she's going to be a new person through Christ Jesus. She's taken off the old coat. She's going to put on a new coat of righteousness through the blood of Jesus. Let's thank God for His blood that makes this possible. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
this afternoon we're going to baptize Claudia and we're going to baptize her, her daughter Dulce. And so, but before we baptize um, both of them, what we want to do is we want to we're going to pray for both of them. And so let's pray for Claudia, let's pray for her daughter, that God just uses both of them for his kingdom and for his glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your awesome love and for your awesome grace, God. Thank you, God, that you made a difference in her life, God. Lord Jesus, that you brought her to you, Lord Jesus. We pray for her and her family, Lord. We pray for her daughter, God. In Jesus' name, God, just be with them, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give them strength, God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Okay, I'm going to need to sit, you sit up. Sit up for me. Okay. Jansen. Okay. Claudia Jansen, that you have repented of your sins and that you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus for the remission of all your sins. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah.
Oh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Hallelujah. I'm so glad I've been buried in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. If you want to be baptized in Jesus' name, amen. What, a, what an important and critical decision. Brother, uh, Brother Lede talked this morning about the washing that happens through the Word. The Bible says we're washed completely in the waters of baptism. And I want to encourage you to be baptized in Jesus' name if that hasn't happened for you yet. Amen. Praise the Lord. It looks, you know, I think we may have a, a first-time visitor here at church in the back. I saw one just sneak in. And uh, I believe, is it Kayla? Kayla Brueggemann back there. Praise God. We're so excited to welcome you to Life Church. Amen. What a sweetheart. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's good to see each of you that have come to visit with us today that are... Uh, a couple visiting out of town. The Lord bless you. And we have some out of town for uh, uh, the holiday weekend. But I'm glad that you came to church today. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, just a minute, uh, Sister Jackie's on her way out here. I, I, I want to uh, rejoice with her because, uh, you know what? She is a soul winner. Rise and fall. 